Hi, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski. And today we are going to do part two of our interview with Dr. Alexander Angelov, who is a medical doctor with a practice here on the North Shore. Dr. Angelov, welcome. Thank you very much, Walt. And I think, Dr. Angelov, for the benefit of, uh, of uh, the viewers who may have not have seen uh, the first program, the first part one, and for the sake of continuity, maybe what we can do is we can highlight some of the things that we discussed, and you can make a comment if you want on that, and then we'll go into, uh, into continue our discussion. Uh, and I would like to remind our viewers that uh, part one of our interview is already on BevCam's website, www.bevcam.org, as will this program be on. So you can watch both, uh, both interviews, part one and part two, on BevCam at your leisure at any time you want. So, um, Dr. Angelov, uh, last time uh, you made, the, you made the, the comment and the statement that you thought that the, the coronavirus was a wake-up call for humanity. And, um, and you said that the, the, the virus will be beneficial and the, the end result is that people will get, will get healthier. Um, any, any quick comment on that? Uh, <clears throat> This is the time when, uh, when we can rest, we can relax, and we can contemplate, and we can look at how did we live our life in the past, and we find out ourselves in the trade mill. So we're running and running and running and running, no time. <clears throat> we have to get more money, buy more things, and, and, and try to find happiness in what we achieve or what, what we gain in all this uh, uh, game of the trade mill. But in reality, it's a screen where you have imaginary life uh, and you have your trade mill. But in, in reality, if you, if you clock yourself, you'll be staying at the same place. So we are not progressing as the humanity. But now it's a wonderful time for everyone to stop and smell the roses. I'm, when, as you describe that, I'm thinking of a, of like a rat on a treadmill, and there's a piece of cheese out in front, but the piece of cheese isn't real. It's just a picture of a piece of cheese, and that's kind of like what we, in our civilized world, are are, are trying every day. I, is that is that kind of what your thought is? That's that's exactly right. So we we were in the Hollywood uh, 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 studio, so to speak where we have a lot of attractions around us. Uh, we travel any place we want. We have freedom. Uh, we can buy a car, maybe two, maybe three. We can, we, we can do a lot of different things. But in reality, the real life is within our connection. So we lost the connection with the family. We don't have time to spend uh, with the family. We don't have time to spend with our friends. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Now, the, the other thing that we, we also touched on um, the fact, uh, and anybody who's been uh, watching the media, newspapers, TV, radio, uh, the U.S. Has, has seemingly been much more affected by the coronavirus than, uh, coronavirus than other countries. And you mentioned several things. You mentioned that, that because we're a country of freedom, personal freedom, that that's kind of a double-edged sword. You mentioned that we don't communicate well, and we, we don't respect each other. Do you want to touch on that again a little bit? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for bringing it up again. Um, in, in, rea in reality, if, if we think about it, uh, that um, the good connection is supposed to be like in a good family. We have different members of the family. Somebody can cook. Somebody can uh, drive. Somebody has to learn the kids. Uh, somebody uh, are doing other things that you put in one pot. And we're so different, and we have to be different. It's like in the body, uh, we have different cells. Cells of the liver is totally different from the cells of the kidneys and lungs and heart and skin. So it, it doesn't make body fight uh, between these differences. So we have to embrace these differences and we have to understand how to make the whole 
out of the differences instead of fighting between differences. And the, the COVID um, just opened up uh, that we are so divided and we start to be divided even more. And before we get connected again, we have to understand the evil of our disconnection. And uh, if, if, you take, if you take medicine, uh, it's, it's just insane how disconnected we are in the system. Like we fight and we have to fight. Patients fight with insurance company, with diagnostics, with the hospital, with the physician. Physician has to fight with insurance company and with the law system. And it's like, uh, you're not doing what you're supposed to be in a good family. You're having your guards all the time and you, you, you want to protect yourself, but you don't think about other part. That's the problem. And I think I see what you're saying. We, we as a society, uh, uh, and I think we see it in a lot of different aspects of our lives, uh, have become so polarized. Uh, you know, rich and poor, uh, people that, that have resources, people don't. Our, our healthcare system, people that have no healthcare and others that, and, and we're not finding middle ground. We're not negotiating. We become so polarized that we, we don't even want to get to a point where we're trying to negotiate equitable solutions that will satisfy everybody. Uh, and uh, I, I, can certainly, I can certainly relate to, uh, to that. And now, the other thing you also mentioned, that, that there's a lack of leadership. We're going back to why did, it, why did this virus affect the United States so much worse than other parts of the world? A lack of leadership, that you say that our advisors are not giving good advice, the government, the healthcare system, even scientists, you didn't leave them off. So that, uh, you know, given that, um, how, how do we expect, as you say, this, this is a wake up call and there'll be beneficial results. Um, how will we go from, from being where we were, where you say that the healthcare system has crashed to where we wanna be in the future? So I'll, I'll kind of leave it there and we'll, we'll let you take it from there. We have to take our responsibilities, that's number one. And I think that uh, people after COVID-19 uh, leave the planet, uh, or it might never leave the planet and become a, a different virus or different problems. We don't know yet. But uh, in my point of view, um, the nature, the nature is playing with us. Nature, if you think about mother nature, um, trying to whisper to our ears, guys, be nice to each other, please. Be nice to me. But yet, you take everything from me. You take diamonds, you take gold, you take oil, you take everything from me. And you polluted me. I'm sick and tired of you. I'm sick and tired of your behavior. And so that is why I have to ground you. So sit at home. And the uh, interesting effect of this is that the nature become much, much better, much, much friendlier. So I, uh, I'm renting the house, which is on, on, on a verge of the forest like yours, right? <laughs> I never saw so many wonderful animals, birds before. They were hiding because we create so much noise with the, with the cutting grass, with the cars going back and forth, with the airplanes. And all of a sudden the noise disappeared. And the animal just look at us inside of our house, like uh, we look at them in the zoo and saying, okay guys, feel how we feel when you dominate the nature. And so the nature is not punishing us, teaching us teaching us how to be nice to each other, how to be nice with the nature, and how can we live in harmony. And so if we achieve this level of uh, understanding and willingness to make one step forward towards each other, regardless of our differences, and we can embrace these differences, imagine that uh, this team uh, of the uh, physicians one can do surgery, another one can treat uh, the uh, therapeutically, another one can do um, procedures and stuff like that. So that's uh, the team that works together. Um, 
the interesting fact is that uh, uh, we're supposed to come from one side of the medicine to another side of the medicine. And we've been in the good side of the medicine already before. We just forgot about that. So now we have second opinion. What is the second opinion? I don't trust my physician. So I want to have the second opinion. Maybe the second opinion will be better. If second opinion is not good for me, I'll go to see the third doctor. So I want, I, it's, it's like clash between doctors, a clash between patient and, uh, and physician. In the past, we had this beautiful um, action, it's concilium. Concilium is when I'm physician and I have uh, problems to understand how better I can serve the uh, patient, how quicker I can make this patient better than what I do. It's my role to have second opinion. I found the physicians around me to give me their second opinion for the sake of the patient. And we, we live like that in medicine a long time ago, like 50, 60 years ago. I still remember that. But now we well, get... Mm -hmm. I was going to say, this is the day when, uh, when doctors still made house calls. I can remember as a little boy, uh, our local doctor making house calls, which of course is unheard of today. <laughs> I can surprise you. I will surprise you. You know, I got, I got to the virtual medicine, and this virtual medicine for me is uh, the way of uh, communicating with the patients. Yeah. And I understand that uh, with all this uh, communication, you don't have to really touch the patient. 90% of the time, you don't have to touch the patient. Thanks to the science, now we have so many gadgets like yeah. uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks I have uh, the kit of the kit gadgets that I'll send to my patients. Yeah. Device like this, little one, I can look in the ear remotely, I can look in the mouth, I can listen to the heart, I can listen to the lungs, I can do EKG and a lot of other things that uh, uh, I have to do uh, physically. So yeah. the physical connection still there. But I am totally undividedly pay my attention to the patient uh, when, when I'm uh, talking through this Zoom. <clears throat> and at the same talking, if I have to, to touch the patient, I do house calls. Can you imagine? I continue doing house calls. I feel myself like a real doctor now. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I, I, and, and uh, I think you're, you're also there's been a lot of talk now on what you're talking about, the, the so-called telemedicine. And of course, these little gadgets where you can, you can, you can uh, read, read their heartbeat and their lungs and, as you say, look into their ears. So it's very much like doing, doing a house call. And um, you are very attuned to what the patient is saying and, and to uh, the, the vital statistics of the patient as, as well. Yes, I now, think... Uh, well, I, I'm, let me ask you this. What you said before about uh, us taking on a whole new mindset, uh, some people would say that you're being too idealistic and it's too blue sky. You know, how, how do you, in today's world where, where we talk about people are so polarized and if, if, if somebody doesn't agree with you, you, you know, like, like people are getting, somebody will say to, you, you read it in the newspaper or see it on TV, somebody uh, makes a remark, you should be wearing a mask, and they come back and they start fighting with them. So with that, with that kind of a mindset, how, how do you get people to uh, uh, internalize what you're saying, and how do you motivate them to change their behavior? Through you. I, I can, no, I'm, I'm, I'm totally honest with you. It's through education of the people. If we be able to outreach more people and educate them, because unfortunately the CDC doesn't educate people. The, the people who are supposed to tell other people, what's the reason to wear a mask? Why do you have to wear a mask? Where do you have to wear a mask? How come you'll be okay without mask, right? So if we can educate people, then the the, the, those people who it, it tuned and they get educated, they can see the discomfort or problem within, within our connection. And we start to make our little baby steps towards our connection and try to tolerate each other better. 
and then try to um, respect each other better. And then uh, we'll get to the point of love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that's, that's the, the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Now, let me, <clears throat> let me ask you a, a, a question. It, just in the last several days, um, uh, and this goes back to vaccine, we talked last time about how you don't feel, and a lot of people don't feel that a vaccine will be once we get it, that's it. That'll be the cure-all. Well, everybody will get inoculated and it's over. Um, but you, you made mention of the fact that the virus has mutated many times and we don't know the side effects. Um, and just recently, in the last couple of days, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin, the uh, uh, president of Russia, has announced that, that his scientists have developed a, uh, a vaccine. He's even said that one of his daughters has been inoculated. What, 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 is, your, what is your comment on that, Dr. Angelo? <clears throat> First of all, it, uh, it sounds to me very unresponsible for the humanity. We have about 150 labs who are producing vaccines, 150 labs around the globe. And we have competition, unfortunately. We have competition, the same competition that we have in medicine, the same competition we have to uh, sell, the, the movies, everything. We have competition. Instead, if you put uh, good heads together, uh, real scientists who are not sold to the government or to the pharmaceutical companies, and who cares about the end results, and they uh, will not make any compromises. So development of the vaccine is a very particular job. So you have to be sure of two things. One is efficiency, and the other one is safety. So if you know for a fact that it's efficient and you know for a fact that it's safe, then is the time to produce it in, 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 in a big quantity. And uh, <clears throat> so you, 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 you have compromised to let this vaccine out. And you have like, you, you, you cut uh, uh, stages of development vaccines. You, you cut studies. You want to be first in the market. You want to be in a space uh, like uh, Russia or United States, who will be first in the space at the same competition. But in reality, you have to be very thorough about what kind of complications you can have. Uh, complications on the rats will be totally different than complications on the humans. And you take, uh, you take uh, the first uh, batch of the, of the people who you uh, try this vaccine on, they're very healthy people, it's people in the army, the young people. And so you give this vaccine to these uh, uh, people and you see what will be the results. But in reality, if you start to inoculate uh, people who has cancer with a chemotherapy, um, have autoimmune diseases, people who elderly, who have like heart failure and other problems, we have no clue what will be the results. So the development of this vaccine um, should be thought through really careful. But then the next step is to multiply these vaccines. That's another compromise. What do I put as the preservative there? Because this vaccine has to be on a shelf for a long time. So I have to be uh, uh, putting preservatives in this vaccine. Uh, do I put healthy preservatives or cheap and unhealthy preservatives? Who can give me full information before I get this vaccine? What was done? So we are not transparent at all. And my solution would be very, very simple. Get the best mind in one space. And I don't mean physical space. Now we communicate it through internet. It's very easy to, to create the conferences or meetings, brainstorms and stuff like that. But then Part of the, part of the uh, study will be in one country, another part of the study will be in another country, but then we developed real vaccine. Yeah. That's... Uh, yeah. now, now that goes, now having said that, uh, Dr. Angelo, uh, you know that our president um, took the United States out of the World Health Organization. He also really sidelined the work that the CDC 
is doing. So that would, that would run counter to the kind of things you're saying that, that we should be doing. We should surround ourselves with the real scientists who are not sold their soul to money or to fame. And uh, some of these scientists now um, get out of the closets and they have their own YouTube channels and they are talking the truth. And if we start listening to these scientists, we'll be in a much better place as the, as the society and we'll be quicker get over this uh, uh, virus and, and get better. But how is the common person, um, Dr. Angelo, how is the common person who, who's just saturated with information, TV and, and, and the internet all day long, uh, and you say these, these uh, practitioners have YouTube channels and blogs and, and et cetera, uh, and you know, the term fake news, how do you know which one to believe and which one not to believe? Uh, we have to start uh, feeling our hearts, what's true to our heart and what's not true to our heart. You know, we forgot about it. Uh, I'll give you an example with the food. You know, sometimes you go to the party and uh, you see something very tasty and your inside is saying, well, don't touch it. <laughs> you'll have heartburn, you'll have problems, please don't touch it. And your mind is saying, are you crazy? Everybody is doing it and you have to do the same thing. So we stop feeling ourselves. We stop to be in tune in ourselves and trust our intuition. But if person tune back to intuition, it's much easier and quicker to find the fake news and, and real news, to, to, to find what's, what stand behind that. Uh, what do they want from me? Yeah. Now, now, last time you, you said something quite interesting. Um, uh, given that, uh, for, in, in terms of the corona, it's unlike other, um, uh, like SARS, it's, it's, um, it's more contagious than other diseases, but there's a smaller number of people, smaller percentage of people, people dying. Um, and, and you mentioned that, that healthy people won't die. Are there statistics that back that up or how, how uh, uh, talk, talk about that? <clears throat> there, there are two factors <clears throat> on uh, whether you have light disease or even asymptomatic or you'll have full-blown disease. One of the factors and, uh, it, you know, the common sense, if people have common sense, it's much easier to understand it, not to believe. I don't want anyone to believe me, but understand it. The first factor is what kind of medical condition do you have? If you have chronic condition, whether it's kidney, lungs, uh, heart, anything, then you'll have uh, higher risk of having full, full blowing disease. If your immune system in a great place, so you'll have it like a common cold. Uh, and by the way, uh, the coronavirus is, is the part of the adenoviruses and adenoviruses is our common cold virus. So <clears throat> you, can, you can get it as a common cold. Um, I have a question for you. Are you afraid of common cold? No. How come we're so paralyzed with the coronavirus? Because people typically don't die of the common cold, but they do die of corona. Right. So it, again, it all depends. It all depends how you count statistics, and statistics is very tricky because uh, if you if you take statistics of how many people die uh, in this six month from pneumonia and how many people died from coronavirus, and how many people died from uh, chronic heart failure, and all of this stuff, you'll see that in different countries, this uh, uh, pyramid of pie will be totally different. Because in China, um, it's a proven fact that um, uh, one day, it were like uh, thousands more deaths than before. And so the uh, World Health Organization 
flew to, to Wuhan and tried to investigate what is going on. How do they collect all this data? And it just happened. It's, it's not because of the reporting of the medical system. It's reporting of the funeral homes. So they, they have, at that day, they had so many deaths. So they have to, and they cannot hide it, this fact. So, but uh, we didn't know about the um, magnitude of the coronavirus in uh, China from the beginning. But the same thing goes from, uh, for another socialist country, uh, Russia and Belarus. And so we had a lot of uh, discrepancy here and there. Um, but so the first factor, again, how sick the person is. And the second factor is the viral load meaning how many particles of this uh, virus per one cubical inch. So if you're in a forest and you talk to someone and God forbid you, you get contaminated. So the viral load is very low. And unfortunately in the hospital, especially COVID unit, the viral load is very, very high. And regardless of the uh, protective gears and stuff like that, Unfortunately, because of the load, uh, massive load, a lot of healthy physicians and nurses start to die. That's a very unfortunate fact. Now, let me, uh, we have a couple of minutes only. You, you said before that you, you, were, you were shocked by the incompetence of our, of our health care system and, and, and our government to respond to this. So what, what must, how must our self-care system, you talked about the individual, but what, what do we need to do to our healthcare system to, to change it so something like this doesn't happen again? What are, what are the vital factors? What are the, what, what are the leverage points? The uh, vital factor is like uh, healthcare system is dysfunctional family <clears throat> where no one talk to each other. No one cares about each other. Everybody fight in this family. Who will have bigger piece of pie? Uh, who will have the first place? Uh, who will be better? Who will be on the top of everyone. That's the system that we have today. We have to convert to a loving family where each part of the healthcare system start to care about each other. And how we, idealistic uh, it will sound to you, we can get there uh, two ways. One is the crucial uh, that the healthcare system has to die. I mean, it has to be put apart and then the new one has to arrive. So it has to be a new type of medical schools, new type of teaching. We have to produce new uh, doctors that forget about the greed because all the healthcare system uh, uh, paralyzed with the virus that was in our country and in the whole world for a long time. And this virus is a virus of greed and we cannot move forward. And the greed virus just hold us. And the coronavirus came here like uh, 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 a vaccine to help us get rid of the uh, uh, greed virus. So, so let's hope that, um, that the earth, uh, Gaia, uh, in its wisdom, uh, is setting us on, on the right course. Well, Dr. Angelov, our, our time is up, and I want to thank you, thank you so much uh, for being my guest. Um, and uh, I'd like to remind our viewers that uh, both these programs, uh, these interviews with Dr. Angelov, are available on BevCam, uh, www.bevcam.org, and you can, uh, you can watch them at your leisure. And uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Angela. Thank you. Thank you, Walt. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. My, my pleasure. And I'd like to remind our viewers that you've been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.